I'm going to show you how to develop a complete SEO plan for 2024, and I'll walk you through each part of an effective SEO campaign from beginning to end. This is normally what you'd pay an SEO consultant or agency thousands of dollars to do for you, but today I'll be sharing it for free. So just follow my process and you can improve your SEO performance on your own websites or your clients' websites. I'm Nathan Gotch, the founder of Gotch SEO Academy and the author of The SEO Entrepreneur. I've led hundreds of successful SEO campaigns over the last decade, and my work is featured on SEMrush, Ahrefs, and Search Engine Journal. So please like this video to show me you're excited, and let's get into it. Let's go ahead and start building the keyword database. So go ahead and copy your domain, and we're gonna go into Ahrefs. You can use SEMrush, you can use Moz, whatever your preference is, doesn't make a difference, but in this case, I'm just gonna be using Ahrefs. So we're gonna go into the Site Explorer, we're gonna paste the domain in here, and what we're gonna look at is we're actually gonna go to organic keywords, okay? And what I recommend doing is I recommend actually exporting the entire list of keywords, okay? Don't don't filter these out, just try to export all of them because we're trying to we're trying to find everything that we can, every opportunity that exists. Okay, now if you have a massive list of keywords, then you may want to start to go into the filtering mechanisms and making some adjustments. But in the case of about 16,000, I would go ahead and just actually export everything. So click export, and then I'm going to do all 16,000, and then we're going to click export. Okay, so I've imported all the data from Ahrefs. And so typically when people see this data, they, they just probably feel a sense of overwhelm. Uh, but I promise you it's, it's really not that difficult. So you're going to notice that there's something here that isn't included in the Ahrefs sheet. And so normally with my templates that I actually use for my campaigns and inside the academy, this is much more organized and a lot of this stuff gets categorized automatically, but I'm just gonna show you how to build this from scratch. So one of the things I added here is this importance column, okay? So when you have a huge list of keywords, we're talking about, we got roughly 16,000 keywords. How do you go through and actually you know, prioritize these keywords. So there's a few mechanisms we're gonna use. I'm gonna be walking you through the various mechanisms, but most importantly, we need to have an importance column, okay? It doesn't matter what you call it, just it, we need some way to actually put these keywords into buckets. And we're gonna be using a, a bunch of different criteria to determine what the level of importance is, okay? So I did critical, high, moderate, low, none. So do this yourself, you just click on the cell and then right click and then just go to drop down, and then you'll see this and you can just add your own little filtering mechanism, okay? So we'll be using this later on, but for now, I kinda wanna walk you through everything you're seeing here because I know this is a lot to chew on. So we're gonna go through each thing here just so you know every opportunity that exists, all right? So obvious, in column A, I'll go ahead and zoom in here so we can see this better. But in column A, these are just your keywords. This is every keyword that your website is ranking for in the top 100, okay? So there's a lot here, right? If you have a website that's already got some momentum, you've already got some keywords, there's gonna be a lot to digest here. There's also a massive amount of opportunity and most people don't take advantage of their existing keywords. Most people just start thinking about how can I create new content when in reality, there's a you're literally sitting on a gold mine when you already have keywords in the top 100, okay? So this is just our general keywords. Then next one here is assert features, all right? This can be pretty overwhelming because there's just a lot to digest here and a lot of kind of nuanced stuff. But for the most part, generally, if you see a lot of cert features, okay, a high quantity of cert features, that's an indication that your organic CTR is going to be lower. Okay, so you just need to accept that that, it, that is typically going to be the case. So what we we'll wanna identify are all of the keywords that have a lot of SERP features because we know that even though the search volume may show, let's say, you know, over a thousand search volume for HVAC marketing, we know that because of the high amount of SERP features that the CTR is gonna be largely affected on this. So although the, let's say there's a thousand searches a month and let's say typically at number one you get 30% CTR. Well, because of all of these SERP features, which there are many, maybe that gets cut in half down to 15, okay? That affects how much potential traffic you're going to get. So you have to consider that. It is a very important consideration. The other thing too is just looking generally at the types of SERP features that are showing up, okay? So we see that there's an image pack here. Very interesting because if there's an image pack, we know that it's probably going to decrease our CTR because what will typically happen is if we look up something like blue houses, 
you'll see that this is what an image pack will typically look like. And what it does is it pushes the traditional results below the fold, okay? And this, this can obviously affect our CTR in a negative way, but it also indicates that we also need to try to rank in the image pack itself, okay? So it, cha it kind of changes our strategy a little bit for that keyword. Another thing here is looking at specifically people also ask, okay? So we can actually just take this, and if you wanna filter through and see, we just go over here, and then we can go to text contains, and we can people also ask, okay? And now we're gonna be able to see all the keywords that have a people also ask SERP feature. And the reason why that's important is because we can go to each of these keywords, and we can identify additional supporting keywords just by going in and, and looking at the search results. So for example, let's look at uh, this one here, vidIQ versus TubeBuddy. Okay, so we'll open up an incognito window and we'll take a look. And just like Ahrefs told us, there's clearly a people also ask. So all of these little ideas here we can use to either increase the relevance of our existing content or we can create new assets to support that main page. The reason why this is so valuable is because Google's literally telling you this is what people are searching, right? This is like quantifiably what people are searching that's relevant to your core idea here. So this core idea of vidIQ versus TubeBuddy, clearly people are also searching these other things. So that means that there's some gaps in what I'm doing that I need to fulfill, right? I need to be trying to rank for all of this stuff to properly build topic authority, right? So you can do this with everything and you can also build a whole list of supporting keywords just by doing this. Um, and, you, and the funny thing is with these types of keywords, you won't really find a whole lot of search volume, right? If I, if I took this idea and I slapped it into Ahrefs, uh, there wouldn't be a whole lot of search volume. There just wouldn't, it, okay? Uh, but that doesn't mean that people aren't searching it. And that's why search volume is very deceptive, right? We can't just purely rely on search volume. We have to use our best judgment and common sense. And we know that if people are you know, if this is showing up in the SERPs, people are absolutely searching these things. So we need, to, we absolutely need to attack them if these ideas are important to what your business sells or what your business offers. All right. So one quick thing on that, on that point. And actually, I'll be showing you later on how to extract those keywords, and we'll be building a list of them. Uh, so we'll we'll talk about that later. But for now, you can you can see all kinds of opportunities here. Okay. So I would highly recommend, you know you know, really looking at the SERPs and understanding these different elements. A lot of them are ad driven. Some are featured snippets. Once again, a featured snippet can dictate your strategy, right? If you see a lot of, a lot of keywords that have featured snippets, right? We'll go in here, text contains featured snippet. And if you see that, that means that you're going to have to make sure that the way that page is structured is a way that we can actually try to steal that featured snippet from the competitor. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. So we'll look at what the competitor's done with that particular keyword, and then we'll try to reverse engineer what they've done. Okay, so uh, so like for this one is SEO a good career. I'll go ahead and take a look at this one and see. Uh, okay, well let, let's just say let's just say it wasn't me and it was someone else. What I would do is I would copy the exact word count here. Okay, copy the exact word count. And then I would try to place this in a similar way that the competitor has. So you'd click through, copy the word count, and then just see how this has been placed, all right? So we look at this, and it looks like it wasn't even at the beginning of the content. It was actually placed kind of towards the middle of here. So it actually took this section of the content and turned that into a featured snippet, okay? So what you would wanna do is you would just wanna try to reverse engineer what that competitor has done, but obviously, in your own unique way, okay? So this is why understanding these SERP features is so important because it can really change your overall strategy. Um, another thing too is, uh, not to get too crazy with SERP features, but I just think it's really important, uh, is also videos, okay? So when you see that there is videos in here, or there are videos, what you wanna do is we wanna actually, we'll take, let's see here, let's take a random one. We'll do uh, sell backlinks, okay? So when you see there's a video pack, uh, that's really important because what we wanna do is we wanna try to occupy as much SERP real estate, right? These are search engine result pages. That's what SERP stand for. And what we wanna do is we try to occupy as much real estate as possible. So based on this right now, obviously there's a high amount of advertising going on. Lots of businesses that wanna sell backlinks. So this is a very important keyword. Um, 
And so what you could do is if if you sold backlinks and that's what you offer, which I don't, but that's just something I've talked about, uh, you could obviously do some Google ads. That would be the first thing because that would occupy one part of the real estate for this keyword, okay? Next one is you'd wanna to try to land in this featured snippet, okay? You wanna to try to steal this featured snippet, that'd be number two. Then, you know, we have people also ask, so we'd also wanna be trying to show up in all, for all of these different questions, right? So now that's number three. That's three different spots potentially, you know, up to five different spots already that you could occupy. And then in the traditional results, right? So we're up to maybe six different spots that we could occupy, and finally, to the last one, which I'm talking about, which is the video pack, okay? So you would go onto YouTube, you would target this exact keyword on YouTube, and then you could also rank in Google, but not just rank in Google, you can also rank in YouTube search. And that's just one keyword, right? This is, we need to think more, not just about like singular focus page, singular focus keyword, we need to think more broadly about like, how can we dominate this topic across Google and YouTube and all of these different platforms? Right, and the more you can do that, just the more visibility you're gonna get for your brand and ultimately the more sales you're gonna make as long as you're going after keywords that actually support driving conversions and driving sales, okay? So back to this, so surf features, definitely mess around with this, look for opportunities here, make notes. It's really important, okay? Um, and once again, you really don't need to worry about this until you start to get into the kind of strategic side of targeting. But for now, it, it is it is super valuable to go and just kind of see all the opportunity that exists. Okay, so now let's begin the process of filtering through all of these keywords. So we have you know 16,000 keywords that we need to get through. And so there's some quick ways that we can tackle this. And once again, this is going to be dependent on your business. So you're going to need, of course, know the business that you're working on. And if it's your own business, then you'll easily be able to do that. But if it's someone else's business that you're trying to help, you're going to need to know their offers and ultimately the core things that they sell. Okay. And when we look at this, you know, most people doing SEO, I'll be honest, they just go like this and they sort it by search volume. Okay. This is a massive mistake, right? This is just, that is not the way you do keyword research. Search volume is one of the least important metrics that we're going to be looking at. Okay. What matters most is looking at the keywords and assigning value based on the likelihood that it's going to actually lead to making more money. Okay, that is what we're trying to do. So whatever increases the likelihood of generating more revenue is what we should focus on the most. So I'm gonna do this in the context of my business which sells an SEO training program. So it's gonna be quite simple here, right? So I sell two things, an SEO training program and an SEO book, all right? So anything that's related to that is something that I wanna pay attention to, right? So what you can do is actually go and highlight this entire column and then you're gonna to go to uh, we're gonna go to conditional formatting, all right? And what you're gonna see is I've I've specifically added a bunch of rules here that will highlight things that I think are important, okay? So right here, you'll see training, you'll see course, learn, and gotch, okay? And actually, I'm gonna add one more in here, and this will be, uh, so we'll do text contains, we'll change this to green, and I'm actually gonna add book in here as well, okay? Because we do sell a book, so I'd rather have this up here. now. These are all related to kind of the broader offer that's non-branded, and this is important because these are all things that are directly related to what I sell, all right? Uh, gotch is a navigational keyword, okay? So anything with gotch in is a navigational keyword, and usually in most cases, you, you'll rank number one for those pretty easily, but occasionally you'll find a, a branded keyword that you're not performing well for, so it's definitely something you're gonna wanna tackle, right? You're gonna wanna tackle that keyword, whether that's ranking on your own website or going and building out some sort of asset on another website to rank for it, that we can get into that discussion, but ultimately we want to make sure that we're highlighting these keywords that, that are most important to your business, okay? So in green. Then these other ones here are in yellow, which are what are specific to my topic as a whole, right? So not necessarily what I sell, but more of like the broad topic that I'm attempting to become an authority in, okay? So that's what matters. So if you were selling creatine monohydrate, then your broader topic would be building muscle, right? Or fitness or strength training or weightlifting. Like you'd be able to figure out that broader topic that you need to become an authority on, which then you can offer creatine as a solution to improve those things, right? So in the case in for what I do, 
Uh, I talk about SEO and I help people learn SEO and do SEO, but if they'd like to elevate their game, then we can talk about a training platform where they can take it to the next level, okay? Just the, it's kind of the, the logical process, but always start at the bottom of the funnel and then work your way up, okay? And then I also have YouTube here. I do talk about YouTube a lot as far as YouTube SEO uh, and just some random YouTube stuff. It's not super important to my business because I don't sell technically uh, an individual YouTube program. I do have a YouTube SEO program in my main platform, but it's not something I ever promote. So, um, so this is what you need to do. I would do it in basically three categories, right? Critical, like super, super important, highly relevant to your offer, uh, highly relevant to your topic, and then ones that like maybe aren't super important, but still you'd like to pay attention to them, okay? Now, once that's done, we can actually go through, and what we should do is we're only gonna filter by the most important ones. So green, all right? We're going pure green on this one. Now, what you're gonna find is we need to, we need to sort all of these keywords based on importance, okay? And the importance in this case is gonna be based on what is the likelihood for a keyword to convert? Simple as that. So in the case of SEO training, that's a very broad keyword, but the likelihood that it's going to convert for my business is very, very high. It's as it's high as it could possibly be. So it gets the highest score, which is critical, okay? Now, we'll look at some of these, we'll look at kind of the differences. So you'll see all of these are marked as critical are directly related to the, the core thing that I sell, okay? Notice I'm not talking about volume or any other metrics. I'm just looking at what is relevant to my business, okay? Once again, brand, branded keyword in here, navigational keyword, also critical, all right? Now let's look at, let's look at some that I would consider to be uh, high value, okay? Just high value. Now these, these are, if someone searches how to learn SEO, they're not necessarily ready to buy a training program. They're not ready to invest in a training program quite yet, but they're, they're in, the, the wheels are in motion, right? The wheels are in motion, they're clearly, they have a learner's mentality. They're trying to learn how to do this. So to me, I need to show up for these types of queries because you know, when they're ready to take their game to the next level, I'm gonna be the one that they're gonna think about, okay? So once again, all kind of that you know, secondary, broader topic that we're going after. Now let's look at, uh, we'll look at moderate, all right? It's kind of middle of the ground type of stuff. And now you'll see the ones that got marked here in this category, uh, are all free, okay? And so typically when people are using the word free, they're not ready to buy anything. I think it's pretty clear that they're not trying to make big investments uh, in, you know, in, in a program. So that's why it goes to that moderate level, just because it has that modifier of free, okay? It, it, it gets lower on the ladder as far as what I'm gonna focus on, okay? Then let's focus on, we'll look at low, all right? And now these are interesting because what you're gonna see is a lot of these keywords, they are other brands, okay? So you see Ahrefs, you see Google, um, you see you know Coursera, and then you know a bunch of other ones. And then there's just some that are not specific to SEO, so like digital marketing. Like I'm not gonna focus my effort on that when I've got all these other keywords that are way more relevant, okay? So they get an importance of low. And then the final category here, which is none, which means just totally ignore these because they're just not even worth it. Uh, you know, gotch, okay, yeah, that's my last name, but what is that gonna do? Like ranking for that, is it gonna do anything for me? Russell Brunson courses, yeah, I could technically rank for that and then like offer my training as an alternative, but the problem is it's not specific. Like someone searching that could be looking for any type of course, right? So. It's too ambiguous for me to go after. These are specific to a brand. These are navigational queries, so I, I don't really want to rank for those. Uh, and then there's just some other random stuff. So all of these keywords are not relevant, right? So we would just keep these filtered out. They're not important, okay? Um, now, we're gonna select all, we're gonna remove blanks, and we're gonna remove none. And that way now we're just left with our best keywords. Uh, in this instance. And in fact, I'll actually remove low from this as well. All right, so now we're left with a set of roughly 200 keywords that uh, we should try to optimize for, all right? So once you've done that, now you've actually got a place to build upon, all right? Most people don't do keyword research like this. They just, you know, it's kind of a just guess and hope it works, 
Um, but what we're doing is we're making sure that we're starting from the bottom of the funnel. We're building our whole strategy around these critical keywords that are actually going to drive us revenue. Okay, so 200, like that's a lot of keywords, right? And we we have 16,000 keywords in our in our database here, and we've broken this down to about 200. Now from here, what I recommend doing is using the metrics. All right, so. Now we can sort these sorted by volume and we can sort it by KD and all that good stuff. Now for me, anything that has more than 100 searches per month gets marked in green, okay? That's just because I know that if, it's, if, if it gets more than 100 searches, the likelihood that you know, it's actually gonna drive traffic is pretty high, okay? Um, and obviously it's a riskier proposition to go after some that don't have uh, a lot of search volume, right? Because you just don't know if people are searching it, so it's more of a, you're more of rolling the dice. All right, but what I want to see really is I want to see good volume and good KD. Okay, if I can find both of those, that's the best of both worlds. So this one here is actually really great because you know, it's my personal brand. So that one's good, uh, which is good. And then looking at this, we'll try to find one that is not my personal brand. Okay, is SEO hard to learn? All right, so you know, this is a good, these are good keywords to go after. Is SEO hard to learn? And how long does it take to learn SEO? Now, technically these are not in my critical category, but they're still in the high and they have good, you know, good metrics um, and they're probably worth pursuing, okay? So this is just a matter of trying to prioritize, right? And you don't need to overthink this once again. I would almost have you just ignore a lot of these metrics because regardless, you need to make sure that you're covering these topics. Um, and the question is, is like, do you create separate pages or do you try to rank these on the same page, right? Now that is a question based on intent, right? And um, so we can look at the current URL that's ranking relative to the keyword and see, is that the appropriate URL for that keyword? But before we do that, one other thing you can do here is on the position change, all right? So you can go actually go to the conditional formatting and you'll see that I made it so that any cell that has lost uh, or any cell that is less than zero will get marked in red. So you can actually go and you can filter this by the color and then we can actually see pages or keywords that we've dropped really hard on, okay? So we'll take a look at a couple here and let's see some of the ones that have really fallen off here. So that, you know, completely lost, you know? So, uh, and we wanna see if there's any critical ones that we've lost. So in this case, online SEO courses, we've lost that completely. So we've basically lost all of these keywords. So we need to probably create a dedicated page for it, or we need to uh, figure out why, why it fell off. Now, in the case of advanced SEO course, I know I don't have any URL targeting that, so I would need to create a dedicated URL to attack that, okay? Now, looking at some of these other ones though, let's see the ones that have dropped the hardest, okay? So SEO training Philadelphia, well, makes perfect sense that it fell off because this is the URL that was ranking, which is an SEO jobs page, right? Totally makes perfect sense. It's like there's no reason this page should rank. So it's an indication, we can actually go and look, that we need to actually build out a dedicated page for this specific keyword, okay? So SEO training Philadelphia, I don't believe we have a page on our site for this, uh, so we're gonna need to create a dedicated page, all right? So this will be one that we can certainly attack and we'll be able to rank pretty easily, okay? Because it's not super competitive. Another thing here too is just looking at some of these other ones. What I'm looking for are just intent mismatches, all right? So once again, here's another one, a clear intent mismatch. So we have a page at one point uh, that was ranking for SEO training San Francisco, but it's literally a paginated page that's popping up. So. Clearly, if we create a dedicated page for it, we're probably gonna do a lot better than the page that isn't even a real page, all right? Um, same thing here with where to learn SEO. Once again, you know, yes, this is a page about learning SEO, but it's, it's a broader page that targets that. And if we really wanna rank for this, we're gonna need to create a dedicated page specific to where to learn SEO because we wanna get really granular with that intent. All right, so this is the process that you need to go through and just keep finding those, miss, those misses as far as intent because what it does is it's telling us that we need to create more content that's more specific to these keywords, right? It's as simple as that, um, nothing, nothing super complicated. And this is, this, what you'll realize is when you go through this process, you're gonna start to realize that there's just so much work to do, right? There's so much work to do on just your, you know, your most important keywords. And like I said, there's about 200 in my case, 
Like think about all the work I have to do just to get these going, let alone thinking about the other 16,000 keywords, right? So spend your time getting this right. Like spend your time getting all of this squared away. And even when you look at this, this is just a set of 200 keywords. We're looking at this 38,000 searches per month, 38,000, all right, just from this set. So just imagine what can happen if you just improve the performance on these. And most of the positions on these are not great, right? I've got a few that are ranking well, but for the most part, the average position for these is 50, okay? So if we go from 50 to hopefully 10, then we can really start to make some serious ground on keywords that are actually gonna drive real revenue. And I'm gonna be showing you specifically how to do this, but it's more of just thinking more about how we go through and we prioritize this stuff. Now, I personally don't believe that you should try to do anything outside of this until this is squared away. I, I'm, I'm pretty extreme about this. I think you should just focus on these keywords that matter and build around them. But what you can do too is you can actually use the people also ask section to get more intel to build more authority around these topics. Now, I'll be showing you kind of how to develop a content strategy here in a sec, but for now, what we need to do is we need to just identify what are the core keywords that we know we absolutely need to go after, okay? Um, and in some cases, some pages are already good, right? So like best books to learn SEO, best SEO books, it's pretty good, right? We're not gonna need to create a new page for that. That the, the intent is pretty clear there. But it's more of the ones when we start to look at these lower positions, we're gonna to start to find some stuff that we're gonna to need to really up our game a lot more. So the next phase of this process is actually to narrow this down and start to pick core keywords that we wanna go after. And sometimes that's a matter of optimizing for those keywords on the same page that already exists. And other times it's for creating new assets. Okay, so the next step is to simply go through your keyword list and start to select the keywords that you're actually gonna go after. So typically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to pick keywords with different intent, right? So SEO training, SEO course are very close. So we'll have to look at Google and see if there's a huge difference. But what I'm looking at is more of, so we'll sort this actually by volume, we can see. But you'll see if we look at SEO training and how to start an SEO business and how to get SEO clients, like those three things are all different, all right? Uh, SEO course for beginners, once again, different intent, uh, a local SEO course, SEO specialist certification, technical SEO training, is SEO hard to learn? You get the point. So I'm trying to identify topics that are different because more than likely, if it's not performing well, as I've already mentioned before, we probably need to create a dedicated asset, right? And we look at the ones that are not performing well, it's usually, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why they're not performing well, but one of the reasons typically is because there's an intent mismatch. So like you could try to optimize that page all day, but if the, if the intent is off, it doesn't matter. Intent matching is the most important thing. Like matching the keyword to the page is the most critical part of SEO. If you don't get that right, nothing else matters. Uh, the only people that can get away with that are, are like huge authority sites, right? They're the only ones that can, but as far as, us regular people, we have to actually get very, very specific. So this one here, how long does it take to learn SEO with my learn SEO posts? It's just not gonna do the job, right? I need to create dedicated posts just for this. So what we're gonna do now is I'm actually gonna show you two different things that you need to do at this point as far as your content. And I'm gonna give you two real life examples. First one is I'm gonna show you how to optimize an existing page, okay? And then the second one is I'm gonna show you how to create a new page. But to optimize an existing page, we have to go through a process. And that process is what I've coined the ranking diagnosis, okay? And this is a, you know, I, I hate to use the word proprietary, but the truth is I created this. I built this ranking diagnosis checklist and it's been tested and it's currently on the second version. And if you want access to it, you can actually get it if you go to the SEO Entrepreneur. Uh, if you get the book, there is an option to also get the ranking diagnosis. So if you go in here, you can get it uh, right here. You can add it to your order, okay? It's 37 bucks. Normally I probably sell for 100 bucks or more. I think it's worth well beyond that. I think it's worth you know a couple thousand, but the point is that it's really, really valuable because you can take any keyword, any URL here, and you go through this process never once, I'm, and I'm not exaggerating, I've never had a URL or keyword that's not ranking number one 
that has passed every single one of these these metrics. It's never happened, not once. And I guarantee even posts that are doing well, you're gonna find all kinds of opportunities. So I'm actually gonna walk you through this with a, a specific keyword and you're gonna see, even with good content, you're still gonna find lots of opportunity. Okay, so I've already completed the ranking diagnosis ahead of time, but I'm gonna walk you through a few of these key points. So this is broken down in the, you know, the appropriate order that you need to go in, and I don't recommend kind of skipping around. I recommend kind of going through this whole process end to end. And of course, you can do this however you want. These are just certain variables that I like to personally look at, and I like to look at these different categories. So obviously, crawling and indexing is critical because if, you're, if your page isn't crawlable, it's not indexed. And if it's not indexable, you can't rank. So all of this stuff after doesn't even matter if you can't do that. So what we can do is you just need to use the detailed Chrome extension and we can quickly basically knock out a bunch of these checkpoints within a few seconds. So with detailed, a couple things here, we wanna see that the page is actually indexable. So you'll see, you wanna see either that this is index follow or there's just nothing here at all. What we don't wanna see is no index. Okay, if we see that, that's a problem. So that is quickly, we can quickly see that. And then now what we can do is we can see is the keyword in the appropriate spots. So it is in the title, it is in the descript, meta description, and there's a variation in the URL. If you wanna get really specific, you could argue this is not the correct variation, but more than likely it's not gonna be a big deal breaker, but I will still mark it as a fail on the ranking diagnosis, okay? Next one is headings. Want to make sure that we have the, the primary keyword in the H1, and then typically you would have a variation in the H2. But honestly, at this point, it's not really going to matter because I'm going to be redoing this whole thing. So those are the basics of putting the keyword in the appropriate places. Now, if we go back here, there's other things we also need to look at, which is going to be on the user experience side. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these, but just at a very high level, we just want to make sure that we're doing things that make it a pleasant experience for the users. Okay, so I'll show you real quickly with PageSpeed Insights. You'll see I ran it through here. And what we want to see is that we're doing well on both mobile and desktop. Okay, I put an 80, so anything below an 80 uh, would get a fail. All right. So that's what we're trying to go for, making sure it's mobile friendly, making sure it's up, you know, uh, the design is modern and updated. This one is. And then the other one that's really important is the engagement rate. So we actually just need to go back to the audit and you can see I filtered this out just to show the one URL. And there's a couple problems here just based on this alone. So we know crawl depth, we got a failing mark here and engagement rate is lower than what my average is on my site. So for this checklist, I do put 20, but for my site specifically, the engagement rate is lower than what our average is, so I'm definitely gonna mark it as a fail, okay? We've already looked at the keywords, making sure the keywords are in the right spots, and then content, once again, you know, you can go through each of these items uh, and you can use these various tools to do it. But what we want to look at here is Grammarly and Surfer, okay, which we had failing marks on. So if we look at Grammarly, you'll see it scores about a 93. Once again, I'm going to be redoing this whole thing. So this is, you know, this will end up being pa a pass, but for now it is a fail given the current content. Now we'll go to Surfer and we're going to see the same situation, right? On Surfer, we'll see that you know I haven't really hit all of the successful NLP keywords. I did hit the appropriate word count, but you know we definitely found some room for improvement on the NLP side, okay? So I'll be showing you how to take advantage of this here in a second. So on the qualitative content analysis, that just means like your subjective opinion of these metrics. So you can actually take this copy it and then put it into ChatGPT and paste your content in there and just ask it to analyze your content based on this, or you can do it manually. So in this case, I did it manually. I know my content. And uh, the biggest issue here is this one. So is the content up to date? This is the biggest problem. And when I show you, this is the main thing that we have to fix. This content is just old. So let me go and look quickly. You know, sometimes it's hard to tell if a piece of content's old because people just update dates like myself. But if we look at the images, sometimes you can get some intel. And this is 2022. And we'll keep going down. We'll look for some older images. We'll look at this one. This one's 2019, okay? So we're talking almost four years old, right? So this thing's getting a little stale 
It's not, it hasn't been updated in a long time. So it, it, it's time for an upgrade. It's time for an update. Okay, that's what we're gonna do. Another thing here is on the product review side. This isn't a product review, but you can still do these metrics. Uh, this is all for Google EEAT. Uh, expertise, you know, clearly showing that it's written by a subject matter expert. So down here and then uh, at the top, we'll also look, you'll see that it's written by a subject matter expert. Trustworthiness, making sure that it has all kind of your basic pages about contact uh, terms. And then lastly, on the technical side, which I already identified, uh, we're going to need more, you know, internal links and we're gonna to need to push this further up into the architecture. Now, <clears throat> that's basically it. This, this page doesn't have a lot of issues, but the biggest, page, the biggest issue it has is that it's old, right? So we need to fix that. The other thing too is you also wanna look at the search results. So when we look at the search results, we'll actually go over here and we'll search how to start an SEO business. And we look at the search results. We just wanna make note of anything that we see here in the search results. So we have a featured snippet. We have a people also ask, and keep going down here. We have a video pack, and it looks like we have some related searches, but not a whole lot of ads or anything else like that. So this is just important to know because it, it can kind of dictate what we're gonna do with our SEO strategy. So we wanna rank in the traditional organic results, but when we see a video pack, we're also take advantage of this opportunity and also rank in YouTube as well. So I actually have a video from 2019 that's ranking in this video pack. So once again, a very old video, about four years old. So I could certainly create a new video to occupy this, which then what we're trying to do is occupy as much SERP real estate as possible. Now, another thing on this, uh, this is not to get too advanced here, but just to show you, I also have another property here that I can rank, okay? I have an, I have an Amazon listing, and with this Amazon listing, I can start to promote this, I can start to drive links to this, this page, and I can also rank this page on the first page by tapping into Amazon's authority. This is, a lot of people refer to this as Parasite SEO, but really what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to uh, you know, blanket the first page with as many results as possible. So theoretically, if I do this the right way, I could have one organic result, I could have one video result, and I could also have the Parasite SEO result or the Amazon. So I could occupy you know, three spots on the first page if I execute this well, okay? So this is really what you need to be thinking about when you're attacking your keywords. Don't just think in you know, singular, kind of narrow ways, you gotta really expand out further, okay? So based on this, we have all these failing marks that need to be tackled, so what do you do with this? So what you need to do is you need to take this information and put it into an actionable format, okay? So you're gonna go over here, and what I do is I just use a little SEO action plan, okay? And I put what I want in here, and I'd actually, actually add another one in here. Um, okay. So what I do is I just add the most important actions that we need to tackle, okay? So based on this, these are the things that we really need to do. Update the post, that's number one. Nothing is more important than that. And that will actually, you know, we're trying to find that lead domino. This is the lead domino that will knock all the other failing marks down. Uh, create more supporting content. So looking at the supporting content here, these are all ideas that I just extracted from the search results and extracted by looking at my existing keywords on this, this URL. So if we go to the incognito window, we can see we have a people also ask section here. So we can keep expanding this and keep getting ideas from this that are highly relevant to our core idea. The key here is to make sure that we're only targeting keywords that have different intent. So how to get SEO clients has different intent than how to start an SEO business. Uh, is, an, is SEO business profitable? Once again, that's a very specific question that's different than this broader concept. So it could warrant having its own dedicated page. And so you'll notice all of these supporting content ideas all have different intent. So I extracted them from the people also ask, and I also extracted them from the URL itself, okay? So you can see these different ideas that pop up in here, like how to get SEO clients, all right? So what we're trying to do is just build a nice base of supporting content, hopefully you know five to 10 different pages that we can build around this page to really ultimately build that topic authority to the fullest extent, okay? Next one is build more internal links. So once we build all this supporting content, we'll take care of this right away because we're gonna be able to just build internal links between all these different posts because they're all in the same cluster, okay? Now, this one here is not entirely necessary, 
But what I'll want to do is not just acquire new backlinks to our new asset, but also start to acquire links to other assets within that cluster. So then we can really build this strong cluster uh, and ultimately build as much authority as possible within this single cluster. And then lastly, execute the Parasite SEO campaign with Amazon, all right? So basically five really big actions. And when it comes to doing SEO, it's the big actions that produce results. Like you can certainly tweak little things and add little keywords here and there and update your titles and do all that small stuff, those little micro actions. But the truth is, what really makes a big difference are the big actions. The things that are difficult to do are what produce the biggest results. Just, you know, that's just anything else in life, right? The things that are most difficult to do typically produce the best outcomes, okay? So that's what we're gonna be doing here. We've got our action plan. Now from here, what we're gonna do is now we're gonna start to build out our outline for this content. We're gonna build out our content brief and we're gonna build this content from scratch, this new piece of content. I'm actually gonna walk you through creating this entire piece of content. And you're gonna see this content go live on my site. You're gonna see how well it performs after it's gone live. Uh, and I'm gonna be basically just doing this on the spot. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is wanna build the initial outline using NLP keywords. So what I like to do is I like to export these NLP keywords from Surfer, and then I paste them into a nice little tab here just to make it easier. So what you can do is you can actually just start to build the outline based on the, the keywords that are most frequently used among the competitors, okay? You can do that or you can take these keywords and put them into ChatGPT and ask it to write an outline for you, okay? So you put them in and then say, write me an outline based on these NLP keywords, and it will put together a decent outline for you. It's a good starting place. Now, this is definitely not gonna be uh, you know, all you should do, but it's a great place to start. So what you can see here is I actually put the outline here to start with. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go back to the NLP keywords and just to inject these different ideas into these different sections. And of course, add my own unique elements to it as well. But this is just to get you a good starting point. You can do it really in a couple of minutes. So like I mentioned, this outline is not very exciting. You're not gonna really win any awards with this type of content here that ChatGBT is gonna give you, okay? So you do need to bring your own unique perspective into this content if you really want it to stand out. And for me, you know, my I don't really talk too much about the philosophy or the techniques that I use in my content very often, but usually my strategy is to introduce uh, really personable stories and really make my content really feel like I'm having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. Um, and I try to address things up front. So whenever I'm building out a new piece of content, and remember, I'm, I'm, this is for this particular example, I'm gonna be actually be writing this, okay? So I just wanna show you what it's like when I do one from scratch. And so what you're seeing here is the intro. I always start with the intro because the intro is really gonna lay out the roadmap for the entire piece of content, okay? And for something like this that is a very big topic, like how to start an SEO business, they're really, this is no joke, right? I need to make sure that the intro is very, very strong. Like if I was doing something like, you know, is an SEO business profitable? I could probably get right into it, right? And just get right into it. But something like this where it's, there's so many layers to this topic, I need to make sure that whoever is reading this, that they can trust what I'm about to show them. Okay, so let me walk you through a few things. And, and this is just a draft, by the way. This is, I'll probably retweak this and make it different, but I just wanna show you what this looks like. And I'll show you this, Let's see how long this actually took me. Uh, so I started writing this. I'll show you real quickly. All right, so I started writing this one at about 2.11, and then at about 2.50, it was fully written. So, you know, almost, you know, a little less than an hour just to write the intro, okay? Um, and there are obviously some interruptions in between there, but let's just say, give or take, 40 minutes, okay, to write this intro. And, you know, most people may spend 40 minutes on their entire piece of content. So just to put that in perspective, when you're trying to create content that you really want to rank, you want it to try to be the best that it could possibly be. So the more you invest in it, typically, the better it will be. All right, so a couple things here. You'll notice, obviously, we've got the core keyword in here, which is very important, so we want the main keyword. I've got the main keyword in here again in the first sentence, okay? Once again, we wanna make sure that's in there. And then from here, my entire objective is just to be super personable and just make this super casual and normal, 
right? I'm trying to stand out by by just being myself, right? And that's kind of my my big secret when I create content is I don't try to be anyone else. I just try to be myself and I try to write in a way that um, I think is easy to understand. So first I'm trying to set the expectation of what's possible here and then talking specifically how it actually helped me as well. Uh, establish some credibility up front and then explain what they're gonna actually see in the content. Now, this is this may seem simple, but there's a lot of thought that goes into this. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a lot of open loops in the content so that when they read these, they're naturally gonna to wanna to go and close that loop. So they're gonna to have to read the content to be able to close that loop. And it's really, it's a really powerful thing that a lot of TV shows do, right? They, they like for example, Breaking Bad, which is one of my favorite uh, TV shows, every episode just is open loop after open loop, and it just keeps you hooked, right? And that's what we're trying to do. We need people to consume our content. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating different hooks to get people to actually consume this content. Because we do know that Google doesn't necessarily know how to gauge the quality of content, but what Google can do is it can measure user experience and it can see user signals, uh, especially when you're on Chrome, right? So it's gonna use all that data to its advantage to understand, is this a piece of content that we should be showing to searchers for this keyword, right? So user experience is key. And the key to, to generating positive signals is to get people to actually consume your stuff. Right, so these are all just hooks to get people in. Notice they're not like crazy keyword rich or super SEO optimized, but they're really designed to be hyper relevant and or, and as interesting as possible, okay? Then here at the end, uh, before we actually dive into it, I, I address the elephant in the room once again, like talking about why I have credibility to write about this topic. And this goes back to Google's EEAT guidelines, right? We're looking at experience, expertise, authoritativeness, trustworthiness. So what I'm trying to do is establish that, you know, A, I have expertise, and B, um, I also can be trusted to talk about this topic because I have a lot of experience in this topic. And I'm gonna be linking out to the various uh, citations just to prove that, uh, or at least to the best of my ability, prove that I should be someone to be trusted and this information should be trusted because I've actually done it, okay? So that's what we're trying to do is establish that credibility and then you know, just get right back, get right into the content. So as I mentioned, the size of your intro is always gonna be variable based on the topic. If it's a very deep topic, you should have a deep intro. If it's a very minor topic, a micro topic, you don't need a massive intro. So in this case, you're gonna notice that we are gonna do this, and I'll show you a couple other examples with keywords that aren't as intense, uh, but this is, this is the type of thought that you should have when you're building an intro for a very deep asset. Okay, so as I started to go through this content, I, I definitely saw that there's a lot of opportunity to upgrade a lot of sections, but also at the same time, I was looking at the existing content. And honestly, there's a lot of things in this content that are good that I can still kind of leverage. So I think when I'm really looking at this, we just really need to do, a, you know, upgrade a few sections, update them and make them more current based on, you know, maybe my new philosophies or anything that I've learned since writing this content. So what you'll see here is when I when I write content, I'm, very, I'm basically doing a brain dump. Okay. So what you're seeing here, this is more of kind of like, you know, this is what it will look like usually with my, the way that I personally write. But this is more what it looks like when I'm just like pure brain dump. And what I'll do is I'll just brain dump everything in and then I'll start to clean it up, okay? So I don't view this as like final in any way. This is more of just like, I'm trying to get everything out. And then usually what I'll do is I'll end up just cutting. Like I'll cut a ton. Usually I'll cut, you know, 30 to 40% of this out uh, once I go through the editing process. So, you know, as they say in writing, like the magic is in the edit. It's not in the first draft. It's not what you create, you know, the first thought that comes to your mind, right? So as you can tell, this is really ugly. And that's by design because what I'm doing, I'm just trying to get a lot of things out so that I can, you know, start to upgrade these various sections. Okay. So just to show you real quickly, when I do this, like for example, I'm already starting to, you know, integrate the new content in here and you'll see, I've already added the new, the new intro section and all of these little details in here and it's not quite done, but this is what it will start to look like here. Now, the next section I want to replace is this one here. All right. It's a little thin, doesn't get super deep into this. So what I did is I took the block of text that I've already done here and I throw it into Grammarly. Okay. And you'll see when I throw it into Grammarly, it's a huge mess because I don't, I'm not caring about spelling or grammar when I write. 
at this point, I'm just trying to get my thoughts out. Then I can clean all that stuff up. Um, so what I do <clears throat> is I'll do a clean, a real quick cleanup with Grammarly, get everything squared away. And once that's all done, now it's out of 99, okay? I've cleaned up all the obvious issues, but now at this point, I have to literally go line by line, sentence by sentence, and start to figure out like, you know, what to keep, what to eliminate, uh, what to improve, right? So this is what the iterative process looks like when you're really creating content yourself. And it's no joke, like it is really serious. And I'm talking about when you're creating, trying to create the best content that you can, this is what like writers will do, right? Um, and it's, it's really the magic in this process is in the edit. So I would recommend using Grammarly to do this, okay? Next thing is, is since we are gonna be updating this post, okay, you're gonna see that this is the last time I, well, I have, honestly, I probably haven't updated this post in years. I don't even remember when I published this. It was many, many years ago. Um, and I do like update the date uh, every year, but as far as like the content itself, it's been stale for a really long time. So we're gonna freshen it up. But whenever you do something like this, the best thing that you should do to make sure that your work has been effective is you can manually track the performance. So you can go into Ahrefs or a rank tracker and just see how it's doing. Um, <clears throat> but one thing you can do too is you can use seotesting.com, which, which I use for all my testing. So what I'll do is I'll actually go in here, I'm gonna grab this URL, and we're gonna do a single test, okay? And we'll go ahead and put, we can just put like, you know, how to start an SEO business. Okay, we'll put that in there. And then we're gonna go to, we're gonna make sure we do just page and we want it to equal. So we're gonna do specifically this page. And then we can choose a testing period. So I like to do really long testing periods. I, you don't technically need to do this long, but I just like to get as much data as possible so I can make really an informed decision. Sometimes I'll run the test and I'll know the answer within maybe a week or two weeks but I still wanna at least run it for as long as possible, so I have maximum amount of data. Um, so what I'm doing here is, and you can write a little description, like you know, updating uh, slash upgrading posts, okay? And what this will do is when you run this test, it's going to it's going to it's going to measure the traffic at its current at this current moment. Okay, so you're going to see the traffic from Google Search Console. You'll see your impressions, your clicks, your positions, all from Google Search Console, and it will measure that directly. Then, once you publish this, like once this test goes live, then from that point forward, it's going to look at those same metrics and and compare the new period against the old period. Okay, and you're trying you're obviously trying to beat. Uh, you know, the previous metrics, okay? So what I recommend doing is just running this test as soon as you go live with your new asset, you're gonna run this test and then you can really measure the performance. I would also, personally, this is just my preference, I will also track the individual keyword rankings as well. So, but this is more of me to look kind of like at a broader level of how this upgrade or uh, update to a post is done. I can tell you from experience, Nine times out of 10, updating and upgrading produces positive outcomes, okay? I, I just see it, and, it's, and, and when you do it the way that I'm describing, which is like really not just tweaking a couple words, but like actually you know, revising whole sections, uh, it, it really makes a big difference. Okay, so the first thing you should do right away, because this is going to take some time, is you should start a Screaming Frog crawl. So if you don't know, Screaming Frog is just a desktop application that'll actually crawl your website, and then we're gonna use all of this data that it identifies to ultimately make better SEO decisions. So you could just crawl your site just as is, but I don't recommend that. What I recommend doing is integrating these different APIs, okay? So you're probably gonna have to go to these various platforms and get the APIs and connect your stuff. But I'll just show you real quickly, the ones that really matter is Google Analytics 4. So if you click on the little gear icon, you can see here you wanna connect your GA4 analytics here and then go to date range and make sure you do the last 12 months that just way we have as much data as possible and then you can also go to the metrics and choose specifically what you want there's a few that are really important so the one that i really care about here is sessions engage sessions engagement rate and average session session duration okay these are really important because it's going to help us identify pages that just aren't doing well from a user experience perspective which can affect seo okay so go through make sure you have all these settings these are the person the settings that i personally use and you can you can choose obviously based on what you're interested in uh, i don't actually do revenue because i don't have uh, e-commerce on my site uh, and then 
just these really important UX metrics, okay? So put those in there. Then after you've done that, connect Google Search Console, okay? Another very important tool where we can use, it's all free, by the way, this is all free data that we can use. Go to Search Analytics and once again, do the past 12 months. And then I would also recommend doing page speed insights. Okay, you're gonna need an API key. So you can actually just click on this and then you can see how to get your API key. It's not super easy the first time doing this, but once you've got it, you can use it pretty much forever. And then from there, go to, and you're gonna have to connect one of these link tools. So Majestic, Ahrefs, or Moz. In this case, I'm just gonna use Ahrefs. And same thing, we're gonna connect the API and then what you can do is a couple things. Number one, I would make sure that you have backlinks and referring domains selected, and then go down and make sure you select keywords and traffic, okay? So what we're doing here is we're just making sure that we have a lot of data that we can work with, and that way we can make really educated decisions about the pages that are on our site, okay? Because we're not just gonna be thinking about how do we improve rankings on one individual keyword, we're gonna be thinking more holistically about the site as a whole and how do we make our website better from an SEO perspective, okay? So we don't wanna guess, we wanna make sure that we have data to make these decisions. So this is, this is the way that we can make really educated decisions. So connect all these APIs. And then a couple other things is we wanna also go into the main spider settings. So you can keep all of this stuff selected, but I personally just think it really drags the crawl down. So what I do is I actually get rid of images, CSS, JavaScript, and this uh, SWF, I just don't really wanna do any of that. And I just get rid of anything else that I don't think is gonna be really necessary based on my particular website. So uh, hreflang is more for international, so I, I don't need that. And then all of these other things, once again, uh, just not super relevant, okay? Uh, internal hyperlinks is fine, external links and canonicals, I'll keep all that. Uh, crawl all subdomains, we definitely want that in there. Uh, and then we'll go to extraction, and once again, you know, you can pick what you want here, but I typically will just try to uncheck as many things that I don't think are super important or that I won't probably use. So hash value, page size, probably not, forms, uh, text to code ratio, you know, probably not. Uh, readability, I I'll keep that one in there and then the rest I'll, I'll keep. Meta keywords, I don't use meta keywords so I can get rid of that. Uh, response time, last modified. Yeah, actually we can keep this in here, that's not bad. Uh, Cause this will help us see like when the last time that that page was updated. So that way if it's out of date, we can actually go and update that, that post, okay? Uh, and everything else in here, I would probably keep, okay? All right, limits, all good there. Rendering, good, advanced. Uh, no, we don't need to change anything there. Preferences, once again, we're all good on this. Uh, there's some other, you know, kind of more advanced stuff in here that you can get into. Content area, like if you want to get super advanced, you don't need to though. Um, enable near duplicates. This is one that I think is super helpful. This will help you find pages that are very, very close, which means you probably need to make one of those pages uh, have more original content. Okay. Spelling and grammar, I do recommend adding these. So this is actually really useful because you're going to be able to at scale find all kinds of grammar and spelling issues across you know every page on your site. And just a general good thing to go and fix, okay? Uh, and then everything else you probably don't need to mess around with. So those are pretty much all the settings that you need to have. And once again, do what you wanna do with it. But the most important thing to do is connecting the APIs, okay? Nothing is more important than that. Connect the APIs because that's gonna give us all the data that we need. And so for this example, I'm actually just gonna be using my own website because of course I can't show client data. And more importantly, I didn't wanna pick a random website because I wouldn't have access to all of their data. So this is just a better real life example so you can see ultimately how to develop an, an SEO plan the right way using all the data at your disposal. So once you've got all your APIs connected, put your website in here and then just start that crawl. Okay, so while the Screaming Frog crawl is going, you also wanna set up a SiteLiner crawl. So SiteLiner is a really, really powerful tool because it's gonna help you identify any type of duplicate content or any content related issues that exist. And it's just, it's one extra check just to make sure that our site is as high quality as possible, right? You could just use Screaming Frog and you, you could totally be fine with that, but I would still recommend using SiteLiner just to make sure you've covered all your bases. So you'll probably need to buy some credits, but it's definitely worth it because you're gonna to wanna to crawl your whole site using this tool. And you can actually just put your site into here and then just start the scan. Okay, so now once the crawl is done, all you need to do is actually export all of these results. Now there's a couple kind of 
nuanced things here. When you export, you can obviously export everything that's here. But personally, what I like to do, I typically would just export only the HTML. If you're really trying to get super in depth, you can obviously look at these other elements. But for me, I really just care about the HTML. So I will export that out. That way this report is not so incredibly massive. Okay, and that will export almost everything that you'll need, but you can also go up here to reports. And there's some other specific reports that you can export, but one I really like to do is redirect chains, okay? This is really important because redirect chains are a huge technical SEO opportunity. So go ahead and export those as well. Okay, so I've imported the entire crawl from Screaming Frog into a tab here, and I've also added the redirect chains into a separate tab so we can tackle those separately. But let's go ahead and walk through this crawl. So there's a lot of stuff here to digest, all right? There's just a lot you can do here. And obviously I could spend many, many hours talking about this, but I'll just kind of go over some of the most important parts. So a couple couple key things. Whenever I'm looking at this, this crawl, I'm not just gonna try to look at everything. I'm gonna kind of break it down. So first thing I wanna do is I wanna look at non-indexable content. So the first thing you can look at, and not to get overly technical about this, but you could definitely look at 301 redirects and just make sure that those are actually good 301 redirects. Sometimes what will happen is, you know, you may change a URL and then and then push a 301 redirect and maybe that wasn't the best decision, right? Sometimes it's not the best decision and actually when you change a URL, maybe it actually hurts SEO performance more than it helps it. So you can look into that and see like, you know, look at the previous performance of that old URL and then look at the new performance of the of the new URL and see is there a huge difference between them and you can always revert back to the old URL if it's performing better okay so don't be afraid to do that because what happens is sometimes when you change a URL if it has existing trust existing backlinks any positive signals when you when you shift over there's no there's no guarantee that those positive signals are going to transfer over to that new URL and Google is likely going to treat that new URL like a new URL, right? It's not gonna have all that those good signals. So I would definitely be careful doing that. Now, we can look at a, a couple examples here. So we'll just take like this one here uh, in the case of Ahrefs, right? So this is an old URL that I used to have. Okay, so what I did is I took this original URL, make sure you do exact URL inside of SEMrush, and then you wanna see how well was this performing at its peak, okay, before the change. So. Uh, we could say, you know, you could obviously look at the peak and see where it was. So I had 470 keywords, okay? Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna look, and you could obviously just document that here. So you could just add a little column and you could just add like 470, just to, just to keep a note of that. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the new URL, okay? So we'll look at the new one and we'll see how well the new one's doing. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one. So we're actually looking at roughly 611 total keywords. So this URL is actually outperforming the old URL. So in this case, you probably just wanna keep it as is. So if you want, you can actually just mark this as green, knowing that this one is good to go, we don't need to touch it. And you could theoretically go through every single one of these and make sure that these 301 redirects were the right decision, okay? So it's not a bad idea because I've actually reverted URLs back to their previous state and <clears throat> performance has been regained, okay? So that, that can happen. Um, so I would just, I would go through and maybe analyze those just to be on the safe side. Um, and then the other thing too is if you have 301 redirects that just don't have any utility, right? So one thing we can do is we can actually close all these up and we'll look specifically at 301s that no longer have any positive signals at all, okay? So in links, these are unique in links. This is the uh, the amount of internal links that a page has, okay? So in this case, the internal links that a redirect has, which indicates that there is a redirect chain that we need to resolve, okay? Now, going back here, keep going through all this, and then we're gonna look just at some of this data, all right? So we'll do sessions, and we'll get rid of some of these other ones. Uh, impression, I will do clicks and impressions, we'll hide that. We'll also look at backlinks. So what I'm trying to do here is I wanna see, do these 301 redirects, like do they have any utility uh, that we need to continue to work with, all right? So what I would do is I would actually change, start to change some of these to zero, or you can actually sort them if you want to. But basically what I'm looking for is looking for pages that don't have any traffic, don't have clicks, don't have impressions, don't have links, okay? Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and take a look here. Let's just look at those that don't have any links, all right? So these four pages don't have any links at all. 
But what they do have is they have traffic, okay? And because they have traffic, you don't want to remove this 301 because what's gonna happen is it's just gonna go to a 404 page. And that means that, that those visitors are gonna just hit a 404, right? And we don't want that. So 404, just to be clear, this is what a 404 looks like, all right? So they would land to something like this, and then they would need to basically navigate their way back to you know, your website, which is not good. So ultimately, you just need to make sure that these 301s redirect to a relevant page. That way the user uh, you know, is, is treated appropriately. So yeah, in this case, there's not a whole lot I can do. And if, the, if this situation was different, like if I had zeros across the board and that redirect has been sitting for at least a year, then I would probably consider removing the 301 redirect. And the reason is because 301s actually do put a load on your server. So they actually make your website slower at scale. So I would actually consider removing them if they don't have any metrics uh, or, or any reason to keep them alive. Okay, so now I've refiltered and I have everything back on non-indexable content. So we can actually filter out the 301s now that we know. And then anything that's a 200 status code means that it, the page is fine. Uh, it, you know, Just make sure that whatever you have here that's no indexed is actually should be no indexed, all right? So funny thing is I actually have a new series on my website uh, called SEO Bytes, and some of these would be applicable for, for that situation. So what I'll do is I'll actually probably mark these as red, and the reason is because I know that I could actually use this content in my new series, all right? And originally I no indexed them, just because I didn't know how they fit into the site. But now I'll probably use this, this content and actually add it to a specific indexable page, all right? So these are the things you need to be thinking about. Uh, as far as privacy policy, you know, it doesn't really add a whole lot of value. So you can keep a no index, it doesn't really matter. Google's not gonna penalize you or anything like that. It doesn't make a difference whether it's indexed or not. I just chose to make it no index, um, but I don't think that's necessary in most cases. The other thing too here is, this one here is a lead generation page. <clears throat> so most lead generation pages, I don't, I usually keep them out of the index just because I, I don't think they add a lot of value. So I just keep them no index um, and just for the reason that I don't, I, they don't have a lot of content. Okay, so that's it. That's what we're looking at as far as non-indexable content. Obviously there's a 404 here as well. Uh, so if you have a 404, you do wanna go ahead and look at some of the metrics and make sure that that 404 doesn't have any positive metrics. Okay, so looking at this, uh, it looks like it does have maybe one internal link here. So we'll wanna go in and find where that is. Then we'll go over here and we'll see if it has any data. Uh, it actually does over the last year have traffic. So that's not good. Uh, it has engagement, it's got a couple conversions, uh, it's got clicks, it's got impressions over the last year, and it actually has backlinks, right? It has some backlinks as well. So overall, this is probably not the best decision for this to be a 404. We should either you know, rebuild it and republish it possibly, or we could, of course, 301 redirect it to another asset. Okay, so, but because it has this data, we definitely don't, this isn't something that we're gonna want to ignore. Like we're gonna have to do something about this, okay? So that's just at a very high level as far as looking at non-indexable content. This is extremely variable, right? This is just my site. Every site is different. Every site's dealing with its own unique challenges. But in the case of my site, these are just a couple of things that I was able to identify just looking only purely at non-indexable content. And like I mentioned, if I was gonna get really crazy about this, I'd also be examining my 301s, which I probably will, right? I'll go on a page by page basis and look at those 301s. Okay, so now it's time to talk about indexable content. So I filled out the non-indexable. You're probably shocked that I spent that much time on non-indexable content, but believe it or not, a lot of people ignore that stuff and there's a lot of opportunity. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start to dig into the stuff that is actually indexed in Google. And we're gonna want to you know, try to improve these pages to the best of our ability using real data, okay? Um, so a, a couple of things here. We, you know, you, you can look at high level looking at the titles and the meta descriptions and all that. That's all great. Um, but for me, what I like to do is I will go over here to the actual data and start to quickly identify opportunities, all right? So with word count, you can just sort this from A to Z. And what we can do is, we could, you could argue anything that's below 400 words is probably what would be considered 
be considered thin content, okay? So one thing you can do is you can actually just go ahead and mark all of these you know, with red if you wanted to do it like that. Or what you can do if you wanna do it faster is you actually go over here in the format and go to conditional formatting. And then we could do uh, anything less than or equal to 400. And what it will do is we just mark it as red and then within seconds it will mark them all. Okay, so a lot faster than just kind of manually doing it. And you can do that across every single column. And that way we can get a nice kind of color coding going based on, uh, you know, based on these opportunities. Now you could even argue that anything below a thousand words might be something you want to look into as well. Um, but just remember word count is not a ranking factor. Just words alone is not a ranking factor. But it is typically an indication of pages that are very, very thin, right? And we can look at some of these, we'll go ahead and hide them so we can see, and you'll see that some of these are like specifically designed to have low word count, so I'm not concerned. So like a newsletter page, we'll look at this. Um, you know, I actually mentioned before that I would no index this, but in the case of this one, I'm keeping index because there's a possibility that people could link to it and whatever else. So I'm keeping it indexed. You know, another one here is paginated pages. You can, you know, it's hard to say whether they're, going to be detrimental or not. I think in most cases, Google knows how to handle these, so I don't think it's a big concern. Um, and then this one here, this is more of a branded series. So I absolutely want this to be indexed because I want, first of all, people to link to this, right? But I also want to flow that link equity to all these different bytes that I'm creating, okay? I want to flow that to the site as a whole. Um, so it's important. And then these other ones, these are, are uh, alumni pages, okay? Once again, uh, this is very important for my business. This is not necessarily an, an SEO initiative, although there are some SEO elements, but it's it's pretty thin, right? It's a pretty thin thing, but at least there's a testimonial. Gary has earned his certifications, but what this does is actually on our alumni page, and if you wanna you know, kind of investigate what I'm doing here, uh, we have this alumni page, which uh, is you know gets people to wanna link to this page who are members um, so they can showcase their skills. But then at the bottom, I actually have a section where I show them how to um, actually embed their badges on their website, okay? And that will link back to their, uh, their alumni page or this alumni directory, okay? Just a little link building tactic in there. We'll talk more about link building later. Uh, but go through these and make sure that like there's a good reason that they have a low word count, okay? And if there's not, then you can put that in the pipeline to improve the performance, okay? But what we're doing is we're just identifying things at a high level right now. Now, one thing you wanna look at here is in this crawl depth, okay? Crawl depth is how many clicks it takes for Google to get to those pages, okay? Really, really important. So, and the reason is because it just helps with, with crawling and it helps with indexation. And the better your pages get crawled, the better they get indexed, the easier they're going to rank, okay? So we'll do Z to A. And honestly, anything that's above three clicks should get marked. So I would just add conditional formatting again. We'll do uh, greater than, we'll do greater than three, and we're gonna mark those as red, okay? So now we should have all of them that are greater than three marked as red. Okay, perfect. So all of these pages need to be pushed further up into the architecture, and I'll talk about how we can do that uh, once we get more into the execution side of this. But for now, we're just identifying opportunities. Next one is unique inlinks. These are just a fancy word for internal links, okay? So everyone's got their own unique criteria for this, but for me, if if there are less than five internal links hitting a page, I think it needs more internal link coverage. So once again, I'll add another rule here. And if it's less than five, then I will mark it as red, okay? And that's just, once again, indicating to me that a page either, we need to go and find internal link opportunities, or it's an indication that we just don't have enough content to support whatever page uh, is not getting enough internal link love, okay? So some of these pages, once again, are alumni pages, so it's to be expected, but there might be some pages in here that need some, some more internal link love. So we'll be talking more about that, okay? A lot of this other stuff uh, isn't super relevant, so you can probably skip past most of it. Um, spelling errors and grammar errors, once again, if there's a lot of them, then you know I I would probably consider marking them. It, uh, pretty much every single page on my site has spelling errors, and apparently every page pretty much has grammar errors too. So this is all stuff we'd want to go through and clean up, right? But more than likely, when we go through and do our page upgrades and page updates, all this stuff will get tackled. Okay, 
Uh, all right, we'll keep going here. And now we're at the fun part, right? We can start using data to our advantage. And um, you know, I've already probably showed you a lot and you're probably, this is like, you know, super intense, but this is gonna be the part that's a lot of fun, right? Cause we're gonna use data to our advantage. We're gonna use data to make informed decisions. Okay, so now you're looking at a sea of red. And so trust me, this will all make sense. I promise, I know this looks pretty scary. But really the red here is just so we can see patterns and ultimately be able to make informed decisions based on the URL. So a couple of things, I, I highly recommend, as I, I mentioned previously, using the formatting, so conditional formatting. You just can highlight a whole row like this and then you can ultimately filter through this information much easier. So a couple of things is on a couple of these metrics like engagement rate, so GA4 engagement rate, and this is essentially uh, it's a mixture of different metrics, but ultimately you want this to be as high as possible. So a lower engagement rate indicates that people are probably not really liking your page very much, or the page is not really designed to drive great engagement. Okay, and I'll show you some examples. But what I want you to do, this is really important, is when you, when you wanna categorize this or you wanna prioritize certain things, always look at your engagement rate for the average on your site, right? So like the engagement rate on my site is gonna be different than another site. So what you can do is you can actually just go ahead and highlight the row. And then if you look over here in the right-hand corner, you can see your average, okay? So 60%. Now this is important because when we do the formatting, we're gonna to go to conditional formatting, you'll see that I'm only looking at pages that have less than what my average is, okay? So if it's less than 60%, I wanna see what's going on because that, that's below the average engagement rate, which means may indicate you know, some, some sort of issue going on, okay? And do the same thing for all of these. You can get your, you know, your average session duration. We know that my average is about two minutes and 28 seconds. So anything lower than that, I'm gonna mark, okay? And you can do that for pretty much all of these, all right? So I would recommend doing this, and this is the reason I'm not telling you spe like specific numbers is because it should be variable depending on your unique website, okay? Um, now there are some obvious ones, like on, in the case of links, we certainly wanna mark anything that does not have a, a, a lot of backlinks. So in this case, I just did five. So any, any page that has less than five referring domains, I'll typically mark as red, okay? Because a lot of these things are working together. And what you're gonna find when you start to highlight this data is you're gonna see that you know a, a page that is not performing well typically has many problems. It's never just one thing where it, it's performing poorly. It's usually like you know 10, 20, possibly even 30 problems, which I'll be talking about how to you know find those very, very specific problems, but at a high level, we can use this data to ultimately inform us, okay? So let's look at a few that are really not doing well. So I'm gonna filter this actually by impressions. And these are impressions specifically from Google Search Console, okay? And honestly, if a page doesn't have a lot of impressions, it's probably not gonna have a lot of good metrics across the board, okay? Just, just in general. Now keep in mind, these are impressions that are based on SEO-driven content, right? So if the content is not SEO-driven, it's not designed to rank organically in Google, then you shouldn't expect a lot of impressions and you need to obviously adjust based on that. But we're looking at this in the context of SEO. Now, let's see what page has, you know, these are all my lowest impression uh, pages. So we'll go down, this looks like row 35. So everything row 35 and up, okay? So let's take a look at a few of these. So number one here, once again, this is one of those alumni pages, all right? So I'm not concerned about this page, right? This is not something I'm concerned about because this page is really designed uh, for the members. It's designed more bottom of the funnel type of content. So I'm not concerned about this. This is more of a content marketing piece, which I don't mind that it doesn't have a huge engagement. It doesn't have a lot of organic traffic. I would not expect that, okay? Uh, these here, very obvious. These are all paginated pages. You, you know, to be expected, they're not gonna have good metrics. So they should honestly, I'll probably just no index these all together. Um, but once again, it's not gonna make a huge difference either way, right? Google knows that these pages exist. They're not anything out of the ordinary. Um, another one here is my new series, okay? So any content that's new is typically not gonna have great metrics out of the gate, right? And especially the way that I've designed this content, it's very it's bite-sized content, hence the name. So it's gonna have probably a lower ses session duration. 
Um, and it's not gonna have, you're, you can't really measure this type of content against uh, one of my longer form assets, right? It just, it just would not make sense. So, and in fact, we can look at this. This is a short form asset and we'll look at the metrics, okay? So, you know, word count is low, only 371 words, but clearly that's intentional, right? That's intentional. So I'm not concerned about that, right? It doesn't bother me because it's all contextual, right? You can't just look, you can't just say low word count is bad, right? That doesn't make sense because it's always gonna be contextual to, the, to that website situation. So in the context of my site, a low word count in this context for this post makes a lot of sense, okay? Uh, crawl depth is good. Uh, unique in links, once again, it's a new post, so it doesn't have a lot of internal link coverage. That will change. Now, spelling errors and grammar errors, that's something that needs to be resolved. Uh, it's, it's starting to get traffic, but once again, it's new, and it's not really targeting anything super specific. So I don't expect to get a ton of traffic. Um, and then obviously engagement rate, okay? These are, once again, these are gonna be somewhat different just because of the nature of this content. And then there's some other things, like if I wanted to improve this page more, I could certainly improve the loading speed here to elevate it. And then of course, looking at referring domains, right? So like I said, make sure you're looking at this on the basis of your website or your campaign specific to that campaign. Um, it's always gonna be super relative uh, in that regard. All right, now going through these, once again, nothing concerning. All of these are my, my uh, smaller posts that are designed to be small. And then uh, these, are, these are alumni pages, okay? So nothing concerning. Now, let's take a look at this one. This one's targeting Kirkwood SEO Company, just to give you another example, which is slightly different. Now, this one is designed to rank um, for a local keyword, okay? So trying to rank for you know SEO Company uh, in Kirkwood, Missouri. So we can go ahead and look at that and we'll just search this and we'll see if it's popping up okay so i'm in the local pack and then if the organically it is ranking here okay so it could be ranking better it's not doing great um so you know that's something we could certainly improve right looking at this though this keyword seo company kirkwood missouri or seo kirkwood missouri is a very very low volume keyword there's not going to be a ton of search volume so you know I don't expect it to do exceptionally well. But there's a few things that I'm looking at that I are problematic. So number one, crawl depth, okay? It's very deep into the architecture, so that's something we could easily fix. Just push that further up in the architecture if it's a really important page, okay? Um, obviously spelling errors. And then sessions are low, which once again, this is really gonna be dependent on the keyword, right? If you have a, a low volume keyword, you should not expect high traffic. It's just common sense, right? Uh, engagement rate is actually good on this, and then the session duration is actually low on this, which means probably the page needs to be improved, which looking at it, it's not a great page. Like, I, it, it definitely needs to be improved. This one was just basically thrown up just to rank real quickly. Um, and then CTR, once again, is relative because the CTR is gonna be bad because it's not ranking as well as it should. If it was in the top three, and it had bad CTR, then I'd be concerned, right? So the point is, is you have to look at these things from a from a lens that it is completely dependent on the type of page, dependent on the type of keyword, and various other variables. So it's never just straightforward that you know you have bad metrics, therefore the page is bad, right? You have to. There's a lot of nuance that goes into this. Um, so maybe let's instead of looking at ones that are clearly not great, let's go ahead and take a look at one. Uh, that might have, let's say, higher volume, okay? So we'll look at one with higher impressions, okay? So one with a lot of impressions, you'll see typically will have less problems, right? <laughs> Just naturally, you're gonna see as less problems. So uh, we'll look at this one specifically and see what this is. Okay, so Ahrefs, let's not do a branded one. Let's do like, let's do this on-page SEO checklist one. So this one here, crawl depth is only four. So immediately we know we can improve that just by improving crawl depth. It's got a lot of spelling and grammar issues. Once again, easy cleanup, right? This isn't always a like monumental changes that we need to make. Sometimes it's just cleaning some stuff up, all right? Uh, engagement rate is only a 49%, which is actually below my average. So I'd wanna see why that, you know, what's going on there. Uh, session duration is good and impressions are good and CTR is low, but it's not ranking as well as it should. Uh, and then of course it has a lot of backlinks, right? So it's doing things well. It's got a lot of good stuff going for it. So when I see this, that's got good metrics, it's got good backlinks. 
uh, or at least at least got the quantity of backlinks. We need to look at the quality of the backlinks as well. And it's got pretty good engagement, maybe just needs to be some adjustments. Then it's a matter of actually looking at this post uh, from a qualitative perspective and seeing, okay, why is this not performing as well as I think it should? Now, it could just be the fact that this is a very competitive keyword and I just simply do not have enough links to rank, okay? It could be as simple as that. It could also be that the content's just outdated, right? And I know that it is. I created this content, I know uh, the current state of it. So if I inspect this image here, we can see what the true date of this is, 2018, okay? So this content is old, like it's old, it needs to be updated, it needs to be refreshed. Um, and we're talking, you know, this is almost five years old. So I shouldn't expect to rank on the first page of Google for my primary keyword with a page that's five years old, right? It's just not, things don't work like that anymore. So although I have updated the date, the content itself is still pretty much all original from its from its previous, previous state, okay, from 2018. So it's about five years old. So what I would do in this situation is I would put this on the workflow to do a complete upgrade, right? Like a complete rebuild from scratch. And when I do a rebuild from scratch, um, the URL is not going to change. It's just the this structure of the page. We're gonna inject just tons of freshness onto this page. And that's not necessarily gonna get you to number one. It's not necessarily gonna get you to your ideal ranking spot. But I almost guarantee that when you do a complete upgrade, a complete refresh, that that content will certainly outperform. And I have proof of this as well, right? I'll show you real quickly. We'll go to a page here, which is SEO benchmarks, okay? And this is a very specific exact URL here. Let's actually get the full URL. So this is one that was really old. Like the original was from 2015, okay? And I let it just kind of get stale, okay? And you can see here, originally, uh, 2017, it was doing well, it got peaked up here in 2018, and then basically it just kind of died off, all right? And what you'll notice here is you see the difference here is this thing was basically dead. Like this post was just completely dead, and then I refreshed it. And when I say refresh, I literally rebuilt this thing from scratch. I did not, I did not keep any original element from the previous post, okay? Completely fresh, using new data, using new screenshots, new content, just everything is new, okay? And then I republished it. And shortly thereafter, performance is there, okay? And obviously it's fluctuating, that's normal, but for the most part, when we look across the board, this, this post has performed much better just from an upgrade, right? And I think it's acquired a few links as well. So, um, but for the most part, we can clearly see that the difference here is not the links, it's the upgrade, right? We've upgraded that content. And of course, Google doesn't know necessarily quality of content per se from a subjective perspective, but it certainly can see that there's been a, a change made to that page. Uh, and that creates, that taps into Google's freshness algorithms, okay? Um, and then from there, when you promote it, and it's a fresh page, people are probably engaging with it better, right? So now we've got more positive user metrics on that post, right? So there's just a whole variety of things, maybe not necessarily always direct, but a lot of positive things that can occur just by upgrading. So I'll be, I'm actually gonna be doing this kind of live in this video, so I'll actually show you how to upgrade uh, a post from scratch. I'll be upgrading one, also be creating a post as well. This is this video is no joke, like we're getting into it. I'm gonna be showing you real stuff here, how you can actually use, okay? So the point is, is when I go through this, I start to just look for opportunities, okay? So I would mark just something like upgrade. What you wanna do is you need to go through and start to analyze everything based on data, okay? Simple as that, right? We're just using the data to our advantage and we're making decisions. And just honestly, you don't need to overthink this either. Like, don't overthink this. Don't think because you have all this data, you gotta become like a data scientist, all right? You don't need to do that. But what you can do is keep it really simple. And in in most cases, upgrading and updating your content is gonna be beneficial, okay? Like, very rarely does it hurt you to make your content fresher. Like, it just, I haven't seen a situation where it, it doesn't work well, okay? So that's kind of one element of this is on the content side. We'll be getting into this more, but, the point is, 
use this data to your advantage. And then one other thing you can do, if you just wanna get a really quick overview of all of this information that you have from this crawl, you can actually just go here, download the whole document as a CSV, okay? Then open up ChatGPT and you can actually upload that CSV and just say, analyze this SEO data and give me a plan, okay? And what it will do is it will it will actually analyze that data and give you a decent plan, right? These are, this is not gonna be like, you know, hugely successful just doing this, but at least it can give you some ideas and at least some, some areas to start. So if you're just looking for a very quick analysis, this can certainly do it for you, uh, but it's not gonna replace the deep level analysis kind of what I've showed you where we're getting deep into the weeds on this stuff. And now the final step since you've made it this far is to apply for the number one SEO training program, Gotch SEO Academy. What you've seen today is just a taste of what I teach inside my program. In fact, Every single part of my process includes proven templates, step-by-step -step instructions, and video demonstrations to show you how to do every single thing. But I won't put you super hard because the numbers don't lie. We have over 50 five-star Google reviews, hundreds of testimonials, and a 9.7 MPS score. You're in good hands. But all you need to do today is submit your free application by clicking the link below, and it takes just a couple of minutes. And if we think we can help you, you'll get booked for an enrollment call. There's no trick upsells or aggressive sales tactics. That's just not our style. So just click the link below to apply now. And thank you so much for watching.